Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening. Our webinar is entitled, What do the Kentucky Academic Standards for Social Studies look like in practice? And so this webinar is designed to deepen your social studies content, knowledge, and pedagogy. Uh, my name is Lauren Glickio, and I'm a consultant here at the Kentucky Department of Education. I'll be joined by my colleague, Heather Ransom, who you heard from earlier. Um, and tonight we are so excited to have our partner here from the Bell of Louisville to talk with us about grade three Kentucky economics. It's important to remember that this webinar is designed to be interactive. Our partner, Eric, will ask you questions and have you engage with sources. So it's really important that you are able to, if possible, have your camera on, unmute when we are, or Eric asks questions, and uh, freely participate in the chat. And we will support you in that throughout this evening. As a reminder, our uh, webinar goals are as follows. So our learning goal is to support your implementation of the CAS for Social Studies through experiencing a grade level example. Our success criteria are I can analyze standard 3 EKE1, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, to understand what this standard requires students to know and be able to do. I can improve my content knowledge and pedagogical skills after exploring a grade level sample. So the first thing that we're going to do in tonight's webinar is to really take a moment and really sit with the standard that we are going to be working on tonight. So if you see here, the definition of standard is on the screen, and it says that standards define what students should know, understand, and be able to do at the end of the grade level. So what we're really interested in um, and what the Castro Social Studies demand is it really requires that students engage in the doing of social studies. And that's why we were so excited this evening to have our partner here with us to do some social studies around the Bell of Louisville. So what does it mean to unpack a standard? So breaking down a standard is all about breaking it down into smaller, more explicit chunks for the purposes of curriculum development and or unit and lesson planning. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna sit with a moment and talk about what the coding means on the standard that we're gonna look at tonight. So if you see our standard is 3EKE1 and all of that means something. So if you look at the box here, this like kind of like four little squares on your screen, you'll see the three. That refers to the grade level that the standard is from. So this is a grade three experience. The next one refers to the discipline strand. So we're going to be focusing on economics tonight. And economics is one of the four disciplines in the cast for social studies. And the next item there is KE, and that refers to the disciplinary concept and practice within the CAS for social studies. Here we're looking at Kentucky economics and disciplinary concepts are the broad ideas that enable a student to understand the language of each discipline and are designed to remain with the students long after they are transition ready. The disciplinary practices refer to the skills students are expected to learn and apply when engaging with the disciplinary concepts. So these are the big categories that students will engage in throughout their entire social studies education that allows them to transfer that knowledge within those categories as they continue on. Grade three, we're going to look at Kentucky economics tonight, but it is not the last time that students should look at Kentucky economics. When we continue to break down the standard, we really have to look at what the words in the sentence are asking students to know and be able to do. So we know that we're looking at a grade three economics, specifically Kentucky economics standard, but now we really have to look at the words to understand what the standard is asking students to know and be able to do. So the full sentence says, explain how trade between people and groups can benefit Kentucky. So what does the word explain mean in the standard? Does it mean make meaning of or to transfer? Or does it mean to accurately state or does it mean to support ideas with details and examples? What does the verb demand in terms of student learning? So to really understand what the standard is asking students to do, you have to understand what the verb is asking for, what explain means, and then you have to couple that with what the rest of the sentence says. So here students have to explain a disciplinary term trade they have to explain, they have to know what trade is. They then have to explain what you know trade between groups and people, first what it is, and then they have to explain how it can benefit Kentucky. So this is an extremely rigorous standard for students in the sense that they have to know what trade means, what trade looks like between people and groups, and how trade between people and groups can actually benefit their state. 
when you are unpacking a standard, you must ask a series of questions. And remember, we always recommend that you unpack a standard with your colleagues so you can have those, dis those deep content and skills-based rich discussions to understand what the standard is asking students to know and be able to do. So your four questions that you should ask when you're breaking down a standard are as follows. What knowledge will students need to demonstrate the intended learning? They have to know about trade and benefits. What understandings will they need to master? What skills will they need to apply to demonstrate mastery? And how might students demonstrate the requisite skills through learning experiences? So now that we've talked about what it means to break down a standard and the questions you need to ask when you're doing that work, my colleague Heather is going to walk you through our tool to unpack standards. This tool is available on kystandards.org and walking through this tool and using the CAS for Social Studies to complete this tool will help us better understand the goals and purpose and what we're asking students to do in our lesson experience later. So Heather, I'll turn it over to you. All right, so you all can see here, this is the tool to unpack standards. These are the first four steps, which we're gonna go through today. Um, so we'll look at each one of these um, more closely. Um, so I won't read them right now, but let's go ahead and move forward to the first step. So the first step is to take your standard, which Lauren has already done a great job of kind of digging into a little bit. And that's gonna be the standard that's gonna go in the left-hand side. And then next will be what knowledge concepts, vocabulary do students need to know to reach the standard. So then just like Lauren has already shown, you would look there and you would see, you know, what do kids need to know based on what the standard is telling me. So they need to know about trade, they need to know about benefits and what that means, and they need to, of course, know about Kentucky as well. So then the next step is to look at your uh, disciplinary clarifications. And so these are available in the Casper Social Studies for each grade level and for high school. And these are basically starting points. So they give you a little bit more information about the standard and, and what that might entail and they get you started. And so this is another place to look to really break down the standard and get a little more information. And so you can see here the disciplinary clarification is people and groups in Kentucky benefit from trade for goods and services not available to them in their area, region, or the state. Kentuckians also benefit by selling abundant or specialized items outside the state to those without as much access. For example, Kentucky's specialization in horse breeding and racing means that people from across the world come to the state to access these goods and services, helping boost the economy. Kentucky's natural access to coal also serves as an item of trade across borders to areas that are not as rich in this resource. So taking all of that, we can think about what are some of those main points in there. And then here are some that we've added to our chart. So they need to know about goods and services. They need to know what an area or region is and understand how that can pertain to Kentucky. They really need to understand what specialization is because that's a really big part of understanding how and why trade happens. And then also they need to understand abundant or specialized items because again, that's just a really important component of trade uh, for third graders to understand. And it's important to note too that specialization is another term that grade three students need to learn it's in another standard at grade three. So then finally, for the third step, what skills do students need to be able to do to reach the standard? As you can see there, and we've already discussed, explain is going to be the verb there. So that's going to be explain. And then you'll look at the level of proficiency for that verb, and that's going to be a level three. So now what we are going to do is we are going to transition now to our presentation from our partner at the Bell of Louisville. This is Eric France, and he is joining us today to talk about the Bell of Louisville and how it illustrates this economic term and this standard that we have looked at so far. So Eric, whenever you're ready. Hello, everybody. Um, as Lauren said, I'm Eric. I'm the programs manager at the Bell of Louisville. Uh, we actually just had our first field trip program today. Uh, so this is taking from our field trip program and how we kind of communicate the standard with our students. So our compelling question actually that we have for our field trip um, is how did innovations in river watercraft impact the lives of Americans? And then for this particular standard for this program we're going to do today, it's how did steamboats expand uh, travel and trade to benefit Kentucky? Uh, so first, just to give you a little bit of a connection to what the Bell of Louisville is. Some of you might be familiar with the boat. Some of you might not be familiar with the boat. Uh, we're going to watch a short little video. We'll watch about the first three minutes of it, just talking about the boat. The 
Labelle is essential for our country because she's the last of her kind. There are no other steam-powered river vessels built during the steamboat era that are functioning in our country today. It's the only one still running that's built in 1914. She is uh, steam operated. There's no propellers, there's no bow thrusters, and we solely use the paddle wheel, and uh, you won't find that anywhere else in America uh, at this age. Bell's place in history, it uh, started out uh, when it was first came out uh, from Reese and Sons in Pittsburgh as a ferry boat uh, to, in West Memphis to West Memphis, Arkansas to Memphis, Tennessee. There was no bridge across the Mississippi River at the time. The waterways were a, a big part of the highway system to move freight, uh, commodities, and, and, and people. And uh, this this represents a, that 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 part of our uh, our history and our culture. If it wasn't for boats like the Steamer Bell, Louisville, cities like Louisville, Kentucky, and Portland wouldn't exist. Cincinnati, Ohio wouldn't exist uh, without packet boats. And that's what the bell started out as, as the Ottawa of 1914. She carried goods across the river and, and then evolved into what she is today. She inspires, I believe, but uh, she is uh, an educational tool for kids and then also an excursion vessel for adults that want to get out, have a good time, eat dinner, take a nice scenic ride on a historic vessel. So now we have one. The bell is authentically a steam-powered vessel that has never changed since her building. She's authentically paddle wheel driven. That has never changed since her building. And she has original equipment. She has original features on our vessel that were just familiar in her day, but very unfamiliar today. If people are going to experience a true steamboat that is an example of the steamboats of the middle 1800s, it's going to be this vessel. This boat is American history. The best part about being on this boat is being on this boat. You can explore. You can check out our engine room. You can go to the firebox and talk to the firemen. You can see it working, moving parts, steam, sounds. You can smell this boat working. When you're on board, you can. So we'll stop sharing for just a moment. Reshare the slides. Can everybody see that? Cool. So we're going to start with a fairly simple question. We watched a little bit about the, the Bell of Louisville, but we're going to look at what is a steamboat, and then we're going to compare a couple of these images and ask a couple more questions. Um, so on the left side of the screen is a picture of the steamer John Fitch. So steamer being the STR before the name and that was one of the first steamers that was built here in america on the right side we have the steamer bell of louisville now we're going to take a moment and i would like to see if you can notice what do you notice some differences or what are things that are similar uh, between the these two images Well, I do not have any boat terminology, so you will have <laughs> to help me. Um, but one thing I notice is I believe that the Bell of Louisville has kind of like those tall stacks or like, mm -hmm. um, and maybe the official term is a, like a boat chimney. <laughs> oh, the smokestacks? Yeah, you talk about the smokestacks. Yes, that's something like that is something that I noticed right away. So, yes, yeah, so there's. Uh, much larger smokestacks uh, for the Bell of Louisville. One of the reasons for that is actually the size of the engines. The engines on the Bell of Louisville are actually much larger than the engines we see on the John Fitch. That's a really good observation. 
Anybody else have any similarities or differences that they notice between these two images? Eric, we got a question in the chat that says, does the John Fitch have orbs? Ah, so that's a good, very good question. Uh, yes, so the original steamboat engine design, uh, they were using oars to paddle through the river. Um, and as you can see on the bell at the back, the stern end of the boat, you see our red paddle wheel. Uh, so they came up with a different way to use the steam engine to propel boats through the waters. But originally, yes, they were using oars on the side of the boat. Let's see if we can get one more. Let's see if we can get a similarity. Can we find a similarity between these two boats? OK, I'm so nervous to share because I'm afraid I'm wrong, but I think they both have some sort of steering mechanism. Aha, uh -huh. yes, uh, you are correct. So they both have a steering mechanism. Um, and generally on all boats, the steering is going to be in the back of the boat. And it's actually very difficult to see a lot of the times, uh, but they're, they are steered the same way with a rudder. Now on the John Finch, you really can't see it too well, but it would be just under the water where those guys are standing at the stern end of the boat on the left side. And on the Bell of Louisville, our rudders, you can't see them at all, but actually they are underneath the paddle wheel. Uh, and the reason they're under the paddle wheel is the paddle wheel will actually help push water over the rudders. Uh, we actually turn better going in reverse than we do going forward, which if you're ever on the boat, we always turn around most of the time in reverse. Uh, so our last question we're going to ask is what advantages might the steamer Bell of Louisville have compared to the John Fitch? What are some advantages that they gained over the years that the Bell of Louisville will have? It looks like it can hold a lot more people. That's a good observation. So it's interesting, these two images, you can kind of make out some people just barely on the Bell of Louisville, and you can see some people on the John Fitch. Uh, the Bell of Louisville is much larger, so we can hold a lot more people. We can hold a lot more goods or cargo. Uh, she originally was a packet boat. Packet boats were actually designed to carry cargo. So that's looks very good. So we're going to look at our next slide. So we're going to look at where are we? So where are these steamboats being used? We've looked at what is a steamboat and the general uh, or the easiest way you could answer what is a steamboat is any boat that is propelled by steam. Now we're specifically using the Bell of Louisville. We're using Mississippi River style steamboats, which I might talk about a little bit more uh, later on. But we're going to look at where are these steamboats being used? Uh, so this is a map of the Ohio River. So we can see the Ohio is highlighted in red and it is 981 miles long. Now to give you kind of a perspective on what that distance would look like, because it's kind of hard to imagine what 981 miles looks like. Um, if you were to walk all day long, so let's say you walk all day long and you make it 32 miles every day, it would take you over a month to walk the entire distance of the Ohio River from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, all the way down to Cairo, Illinois. So the, our boat, the Bell of Louisville and steamboats, uh, they could actually make that journey in less than a week. So using the rivers was much quicker and easier uh, to travel that way than it would be uh, to walk. Now, while we're on this uh, map here, does anyone have any questions that they may notice or uh, want to know more about when we're looking at the map? We have all of the blue rivers you see here. Those a lot of the smaller ones feed into the Ohio. So why does the Ohio River start in Pittsburgh? Because that's in Pennsylvania. So that is a very good question. <laughs> I don't know if there's a good way to answer that without going into a whole bunch of geography details. Um, so one of the things about the, the river systems on this part of the country is, and we'll actually look at this a little bit later on, is how uh, they drain or cut through the land. Um, 
A fun experiment uh, that we actually had happen at the boat recently is if you ever have um, near a riverbank or anything like that that has mud or silt, if there's any water rise and then it dissipates, you'll actually see rivulets uh, cut through the mud that actually look very similar to these river systems. Uh, so I can't give you an exact, we have to go look up the geography, exactly why it starts in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, but it does go through actually six states. Uh, so it drains the water from six states. So the Ohio takes in a whole bunch of water. So we're going to look at looking at our map. Um, so meeting the map, uh, what do you all see? And a simple question is, does the map have a title? So this is to help students kind of look at um, the map itself and help them read the map for themselves. So what do we see on this map? There are lots of rivers other than just the Ohio, which is obviously emphasized. Yes. We see so the key, we see the key that tells us what those rivers, the Ohio River, the cities, the state boundaries. Yes. And does our map have a title? One more. What was the question? Does our map have a title? Oh, rivers? Yes. So we're going to go and discuss a little bit more about the map. So one of the, this is um, a resource that can, you can use anytime you have students looking at uh, maps. They can use this to um, circle what they find on their map. So some maps have a legend or a scale. Some show lakes, some show rivers and cities. And so this is um, a way that they can actually interact and learn a little bit more about it and circle what they would find on the map. So how many other rivers are connected to the Ohio River? This is going to be a little bit of a trick question, but how many can you see connected directly to the Ohio River? I'm driving, but so I'm not really looking at the map. Don't anybody worry. But I know because I just left there. I know that the Big Sandy and I can't see them this, on this map of the Big Sandy's being recognized as flowing into the Ohio River because it converges at Ashland, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little bit of a trick question because there's actually more rivers that are not all shown on this particular map. Uh, they show kind of the, the larger tributaries, but it doesn't show them all. But on our particular map, uh, anybody who's not driving, uh, can you see how many rivers are connected to the Ohio? Is it 12? Close. <laughs> I'm counting 13 myself. If you count the river going through Pittsburgh as one river. So here's a question. So we have all of these rivers, right? We have a number of cities that are depicted on our map, and they're all connected together. You can kind of think of rivers as connectors. Um, anyone on uh, the same river system who had access to the water and a boat could access all of the other cities, right? So it's a way to connect uh, people and places together. Um, how can people benefit from living near one of these rivers? What would be a, a benefit to that? Transportation. You would have access to goods and to trade. Right, so we have transportation, right? It helps us get around and we have access to goods because somebody in um, Davenport, for example, might have something that someone in Louisville doesn't have and you could trade in between those two cities just by being connected to the same river system. So to, before we move on, does anybody have any questions about this particular map? I'm wondering why the Mississippi has the extra blue, um, I guess, boldness of mm -hmm. the line. Like, is that indicating something different? I know we're looking at the Ohio, but of all of the others, the Mississippi is the, the Mississippi. only one that has that extra kind of shaded area. Yeah, yes. I wonder if that was water volume or. So great question. Um, so for this particular map, it's just highlighting where the Mississippi River is. 
Um, and this gets a little bit complicated because some people actually disagree on this, but um, it's generally that all of the rivers you see here, including the Ohio, are tributaries of the Mississippi River. Um, so they all drain into the Mississippi River. So the Mississippi River for this section, and we'll look at um, the rest. There's a larger section to this map that'll point this out a little bit more, but it's just noting the, the main point of the Mississippi River because all of these rivers actually drain into the Mississippi. So for this map, it's just to highlight it. Although, interestingly enough, in before we started trying to control where rivers flow a lot more, in the 1800s, uh, the Mississippi's channel actually changed all the time. Uh, there was no map that would be accurate from year to year. It would actually change all the time. It's actually much more stable now than it ever was before. So we're going to do uh, really quickly, uh, quick right. Um, how did steamboats improve travel? So we're going to cite evidence from what we've learned to support your answer. And then if you could submit those in the chat, if possible. And then Eric, I'll read those to you once we get those. Great. Do you want me to just uh, keep going forward or give a give a moment? We, we can give him a minute to um, cool. it always takes a little bit longer to type in the chat. So oh, we'll yeah. give him a minute and then I'll let you know the first couple that come in. I see some sounds good. So we have our first response in from Rachel. It talks about making access to goods quicker, less than a week compared to walking up to a month. And we have it shortened the distance to travel. And we have another response that says people could use steam powered vessels instead of animals to move goods or people. Mm -hmm. And they help them travel faster. So we're seeing a theme in the responses. So thank you, everyone who keeps responding. Yeah, that's a. Those are great points. Um, all of those reasons are once steamboats came around. The first really successful steamboat uh, for the lower Mississippi area was built around 1811, and the first steamer to actually go from Louisville to New Orleans um, was in 1812 aptly named the New Orleans, uh, the steamer. Um, and once those came around, it opened up this entire side of the country to all kinds of new trade possibilities. And specifically, this benefited Kentucky as well, being on the Ohio. Um, our cities located here, uh, we had a lot more um, advantages that were opened up to Kentucky just through steamboat travel and use. So we're going to go to the next slide. So this is a map, the full map, of the uh, Western River system. Now, the Ohio River, if you guys can see my cursor, is located right here. So this is the, the portion of the map from Pittsburgh um, all the way down to Cairo that we were looking at before. So we have Kentucky right here, and we've got Louisville, and this is where the Ohio is located. But as you can see, the Ohio is 981 miles long, but it is only just part of the Western River system. It covers this whole, uh, what they would have called uh, the West in the 1800s or 1700s, um, and it's all connected together. And the interesting thing is that all of these smaller rivers that are located on here drain into the larger rivers, and all of the larger rivers drain into the Mississippi River, which then in turn drains into the Gulf of Mexico all the way down at New Orleans. So I'll show you a little bit of a graph. So all of these major rivers, the Missouri, the Mississippi, and the Ohio, all of that water comes out at New Orleans. Now, the flow, the direction of a river, so rivers, they're constantly moving. Uh, it's not like a lake, so a lake would stand still, right? We have the Great Lakes up near Michigan uh, to the north. Those they don't move around a whole bunch, but rivers are constantly moving. They're constantly flowing. And for all these rivers here, they are flowing southward, so in the southerly direction. Now, when boats were using these rivers to get around and connect with other places and city for traveling or trading goods, um, they would use what's called a flat boat or a raft. So it's just, you can imagine in your head, just a flat bottomed boat. You'd put all your goods or whoever wanted to travel on board and you would follow the river's current downriver. So you would go with the river's current. 
it was much more difficult to go back up river against the river's current. Um, you could do it, but it was very difficult. You had to use oars or poles uh, to push your boat through, or sometimes they would even get out um, and pull their boats by ropes to actually go against the river's current. So it was very difficult. So a lot of times, you would actually, if you were, say, a farmer in Kentucky, you might load up on a flatboat on the Ohio, you know, travel down to the Mississippi River all the way down to New Orleans. But when you wanted to go back home, when you wanted to go back to Kentucky, you would either walk, ride a horse or charter a boat to take you all the way up the East Coast on the ocean and come back over land uh, after you landed on the East Coast. However, once steamboats were invented, a steamboat can go up or down the river regardless of the current. If you're going to go against the current, it might take a little bit more fuel, but you can basically go anywhere you want very, very easily. So once steamboats were invented and started being used, they basically doubled the amount of river access that you had uh, previously if you were looking at a flat boat or a raft. So we're going to discuss a little bit. Why did steamboats have an advantage over other types of watercraft and then use evidence in your response? So we have a response in the chat. It says they doubled the amount of rivers people in the area had access to. And also on this one, you can also feel free to unmute and just share. Yes. We have another, we have another response that says the steamboat can power itself upstream. You didn't have to pull it, for example. People had the chance to make more money because if they could, you know, you know, get on the boat if they had their goods. And they would have a, a bigger market sometimes when they got on the boat to sell those goods. Yes, definitely. Those are all our responses from the chat. Great. So we're going to look at another map. This is a map of the world. Um, and we point out where the United States is. These, the Western River system that we just looked at, right? All those rivers connected together actually helps Kentucky and all the other states connected to that river system connect with the rest of the world. And the way this, especially through uh, trade, and the way that this was done is our river system is located uh, through here. This star represents where uh, Louisville and Kentucky is. And so you would take your goods and you could head down to New Orleans. Remember I said all of those rivers, all that water heads down to New Orleans. So New Orleans became like this trading hub for the whole country because all of these goods could make their way down to New Orleans during the flatboat trade and then uh, continued through to the steamboat trade. But at New Orleans, you also had goods coming from Europe across the ocean. You had goods coming from the Caribbean to the south, things like sugar and molasses. And from Europe, you might have, you know, fine textiles and things like that. And they're all coming to New Orleans. So at New Orleans, you could uh, if you were from Europe, you could trade for goods that were from the Americas. You might have seeds or different things that we were making here. And then same thing if you were coming from the Caribbean and vice versa. Americans had now had access to goods from Europe and the Caribbean that could then be distributed by steamboats heading back up river all over the Western River system. We're actually going to take a look at some of these goods. So these um, are porcelain buttons from France. And this image, uh, these are buttons that were actually found on a steamboat. Uh, she was the steamboat Arabia. She sank in the Missouri River in 1856. And the interesting thing about uh, where she sank is uh, her cargo was preserved in the mud of the river. Now, the river's course, I mentioned earlier, the Mississippi changes its course all the time. The Missouri changed its course as well since 1856. And so actually they dug up the Arabia in the middle of a farmer's field. Uh, so the entire boat was preserved, including her cargo. So we're going to take a look at some of the things that were shipped on this steamboat on the Western River system. All right, so I have a number of things here. Um, so the first question is just, what do you see? And you can unmute or type in the chat, either way. Uh, 
A variety of goods. Okay, so a variety of goods. What do you think about that? What do you think about the variety? We have one comment from the chat that says quite a range of small goods. Mm -hmm. So what could that tell us? We have quite a, a number of things. Um, what could that tell us? And somebody also mentioned they were small goods, which could be interesting. And they seem to be practical goods that they would that would be used for life at that time. And then we have another comment in the chat that echoes Melissa's comment. It says that some things are necessary for survival, but some are more nice to have. And there's another comment that says a variety likely means lots of small independent sellers. That's an interesting point. Yeah, that's a possibility. One of the things I like to think about, uh, especially is with the pocket knives. Uh, it makes me wonder, you know, there's so much there were so many pocket knives found on board. And was it that they were going to be using the pocket knives for trade, or was it that just that everyone on board had a pocket knife? Or, you know, why were pocket knives so popular if they were going to be trading those? One interesting thing about the assorted pie fruit uh, is they also found apparently the country's oldest pickles on board the boat, which were you apparently could still eat. So they were still so well preserved, they were good. Does anybody have anything that they're wondering about that they would like to know more about? I um, Sorry, you can go ahead, Kim. No, I, I was just going to wonder because I can't see the picture really well, but I would love to know where everything comes from. So for these goods, uh, I don't have the shipping manifest to know exactly where are the, all the articles came from. However, all of the goods that you see came from the steamboat Arabia. So everything you see uh, in the pictures, it's part of her cargo. In fact, it's only a very, very small part of her cargo. Uh, there's still um, going our from the archaeological dig that they did, they're still getting a lot of the uh, cargo cleaned and ready to be displayed. This is actually images from uh, the museum in Missouri about the Steamboat Arabia, uh, but she actually was carrying a huge amount of cargo. Apparently, um, back during the 1800s, and especially like the heyday of steam, the Steamboat era in the mid 1800s, um, if you were able to make one, two trips that were successful as far as trading, you traded so many goods that it would completely pay for the boat. Um, the boat was actually the cheap part. The cargo was the important part. They carried so much cargo on these steamboats um, that you could just pay for the entire boat with one or two trips. And that's actually why here in Louisville, it's one of the reasons uh, our city actually thrived during this time period, uh, is because steamboats would come to Louisville, unload all of their goods because of the falls of the Ohio, they would take the steamer through the falls, it'd be kind of dangerous, and then they would take the goods and reload them past the falls because they weren't as worried about the boat itself. It was all of the goods that was important. They didn't want to lose the goods in the falls. And then Eric, we had a, we had one question that said, we had a couple of things in the chat, and I know Maggie, you were going to unmute and respond, but we had a question that said, could you tell us again where the dig site was? Um, Caitlin mentioned that the buttons uh, say that they're from France. And then Rachel mentions how were some items stored, thinking specifically about candles, keeping them dry from getting hot and melting. So the dig site is in Missouri, and I can look up the exact city. I don't have it uh, in front of me. Um, we'd have to look up the exact city where it is. Uh, there is a museum dedicated to the Steamboat Arabia. And they have the information there, and I would have to find that for you. And as far as packing uh, the cargo, I don't specifically know how they would actually pack the candles. That would be something uh, to look into and research. Um, those are actually some of my favorite questions uh, because it can lead you down um, areas and paths you previously didn't know about. But I'm not sure exactly how they would pack the candles on board the steamboat. Um, I will say, one of the things about packing a steamboat, and this would actually, they would have 
a, a position called the purser and their job specifically was doing uh, basically the, the packing of the boat. And so they would determine where somebody's cargo would be kept on board. So if you had something that was perishable, if you had something like candles to keep them dry or uh, anything like that, they would determine where everyone's cargo was actually stored on board. And I know we're getting limited on time. We have a few more wondering. So just wonder, uh, Caitlin asks, are the items picked up along the way as they travel along the river? Maggie then asks or stated, Eric touched on this with the cost and the amount of a single steamboat trip might earn. But I was wondering what the current day cost of what was lost might have been. So we have a lot of additional wonderings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll start with um, where did like the goods come from? Did they get them along the, the way or not? Um, it did vary. Uh, so it, it just depended. Some boats you might like completely load up and you have a specific uh, destination in mind. You're going to take these things to this place. Um, it just depended. Uh, it, it was actually up to the boat's owner or operator to determine how they wanted to use the boat. It was very common for steamboats to stop along the river uh, and trade along the way. Um, there was a period in the early 1800s to mid 1800s where uh, farmers would try to divert the Mississippi River uh, to their farm more specifically so that steamboats would stop at their farm to trade or pick up goods. A lot of times what you would do is you would take uh, your goods, let's say uh, you worked with um, corn uh, and you had your corn you wanted to sell and you were going to sell it to a steamboat, you would take it to the river. Uh, and then as a steamboat was coming by, you would hail them down and make a deal with the purser and you would sell your corn to that steamboat uh, right then and there or trade your corn for whatever they had on board that you wanted. Uh, that was a common practice. So it kind of depended. Sometimes you could specifically be chartered to take this good or these goods to this place from this place. And then sometimes they would just head down the river, stopping at all the different towns, just trading goods as they went. And it was the purser's job to control all of the money. And it was the captain and pilot's job to determine when and where they stopped. And it was the owner's job to try to uh, make sure everything worked and operated. Uh, and then there was another question. What was uh, what was one of the other questions? So Maggie asked, uh, she was wondering what the current day cost of what is like was lost, what that might have been. That's a so great. Yeah, that is a great question. I would have to put it into an inflation. Uh, calculator because I'm not 100% sure what today's uh, cost or value would be. It would be a lot. Um, as an example, I believe the bell was purchased at auction for around, I think it was $35,000 uh, for the boat itself. So if we were just, you know, guesstimating uh, if your cargo is worth as much or more than the boat. So in the 1960s, the boat was worth $37,000. Um, back then, you can kind of maybe get a rough idea of what it might be, but I would have to go. Um, I'd have to look into a little bit more specifics on inflation for the time period. That's a great question, though. So I'm going to move to the next slide and we'll quickly go through this one. Uh, we're going to be trying to make a little bit of sense out of the artifacts we were looking at. This is a way we could examine these a little bit closer. Um, but if you all could just in looking at this image, pick one of the artifacts. And we'll just do a couple of the questions on on the side. Uh, what do you think the artifact was used for? And why do you think these items were traded? So those two two questions. So pick one of the artifacts in the uh, image and then those two questions and you can unmute or type in the chat. And just let me know how we're doing on time as well. You've got about 15 minutes. OK, great. If anyone wants to unmute. Maybe porcelain was really uncommon in some of the areas along the river um, and maybe manufactured easily or more often in France. So that could be a reason why it was um, part of the cargo that supply demand connection. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so. Europe, especially when it came to things like fine textiles and clothing and things like that, a lot of times they had much more advanced production uh, places and systems uh, than they did over in the States, especially in the 1800s. And so uh, fine goods and fine clothing and things like, you know, 
fancy porcelain buttons uh, were more easily obtained from Europe than they were actually made in our country. We had a lot of natural resources, um, which is interesting because Europe was running lower on the those kind of resources. So it was a good way for the two areas to trade. And we had a comment from Stacy Eric that actually kind of mirrored that maybe we didn't have the means to make the fancy buttons. So it's interesting that that connection is there. Uh, Melissa mentioned candles for light in the chat. And then Kristen also mentioned that she picked the canned food, fruit. And she said this was used to help people survive through winters or move away from subsistence farming to other industries. Yes, those are all great, great observations. And then we have one uh, last comment about buckets, pots, kettles, and washboards are items used for domestic use. So again, I think that goes back to your ma manufacturing comment earlier about what we were able to produce in this region versus what they were able to get. And you see, you see that um, that concept reflected in, within the states as well. So it's reflected in some of the things like for coming from Europe, the fine textile, stuff like that. Uh, but it also was reflected in the states. So a lot of your southern uh, states had a lot of access to uh, crops and things that they grew. And then a lot of the northern states had more access to production and manufacturing and metalworking. So there was a lot of trade between the northern and southern areas or regions based on what they needed or what they were making or what they were growing. All right. So a claim support question, uh, write a claim that answers this question. How did Kentucky benefit from the opportunities steamboats provide? Uh, did? Identify evidence from sources to support your claim and ask a question related to your claim or the supports. What isn't explained? We'll take just a few minutes to do that. And if it's easier for you to unmute and share, you can do that as well. But I'm also monitoring the chat. So we have our first response in. Kristen said steamboats have Kentuckians access to global trade and commerce, which I'm sure gave people who maybe weren't part of land owning wealthy class new opportunities. I'm wondering what new inventions are changing our trade today. Mm -hmm. And then Kim says Kentuckians were able to make more money if they could get their goods to river ports and also with that extra money to buy those luxury goods. And I'm sorry, Chris, Kristen just fixed a typo on one of her responses and I did not see that when I read it. So I'm sorry, Kristen, I didn't get that in it. And then we have a response from Maggie and Maggie says Kentucky was able to have access to good, goods otherwise unavailable. As an example, the imports from France. I wonder how this was present when the Kentucky Derby first started running. How did that import system contribute to the fashion element of that event that is so mm -hmm. Spot that is spotlight, spotlighted, sorry, so often today. Uh, Kentucky benefited from the trade opportunities that opened up with the Steamboat's ability to transport goods. Um, I'll do two more uh, just in the sake of time. Kentucky was able to access goods, not, and this is from Rachel, not otherwise available to them as a result of steamboat technology. This is no, noted in the source that shows what was available on some steam powered ships, the buttons from France. Those buttons are very popular this evening. It also <laughs> allowed them to trade with people that didn't specialize in some of the natural materials available in Kentucky, since the steam powered boats could move up and down, up and down river easily, as shown in the maps. Kimberly was wondering um, if the cities along the river were our largest cities at the time and if they are still some of the largest in regards to population. So I love these questions. <laughs> we spend a lot of time on these questions. Um, so and it, 
Eric, what we might need to do too is that if you could, I know we're running short on time and thank you everybody for your responses. So Eric, if you could maybe to just like skim through the last couple ones that they'll yes. look at and then we can show everyone where to access this information after the webinar. Great. Uh, so we're going to look at some uh, something actually that has might answer a little bit of one of the questions. Um, so we would analyze, uh, we're going to talk about river systems, how they're used today. Um, so we had the flat boat systems, uh, the raft system before steamboats kind of expanded on that, being able to go up and down the rivers, but still using the same rivers. And then today we actually use tows and barges. Uh, so there's a little bit of information here on how to help students analyze these photographs. Uh, so these are of tows and barges here uh, passing by the wharf at Lowell. Um, and the one interesting thing you were asking about the, the innovations of it. So Today, we actually lash barges together, so we what's called a 15 barge tow, and you can kind of see it on the image on the left. Uh, it's three barges wide, uh, and then it would be five barges um, deep. Uh, so it'd be 15 barges altogether, which is the maximum size on the Ohio River, and it's because of our lock and dam systems, it can only fit that much. But you can carry the same amount of cargo on a 15 barge tow as 800 semi trucks on the roads. So they can transport massive amounts of uh, cargo and uh, trade goods on the rivers at very low cost. You're only running just the boat. Um, so it's still a very economical way to trade uh, even today. And then we're going to talk. We talked just a little bit about that, about how the trade systems um, today have changed a little bit over time. And one of them is the lock and dam systems is actually to make sure our rivers are passable. Uh, in Louisville, back in the old around 1800s um, time, there would no, sometimes be only two or three, maybe four months out of the year that was considered safe for a steamboat to travel through, especially over the falls of the Ohio. And so we've on our river systems, we've dug canals, we use uh, dams um, and lock systems to actually make sure that river traffic and commerce can continue 24 seven uh, on the river 365 days a year. So our last part is a uh, task aligned to the supporting question. So answer the supporting question. How have steamboats expanded travel and trade to benefit Kentucky, which is similar to some of the things we've already discussed? Uh, in your response, provide evidence from at least two different sources you investigated. Do we have the direction oh. here about submitting it in the chat? Would anybody be willing to answer these questions for us? Just to summarize maybe what mm -hmm. we've learned tonight about steamboats. Come on, y'all. Y'all like those buttons. How did we get them? <laughs> I don't mind to share, but I joined a little late, so I'm not sure that I have two different sources. So I'm going to ask for grace and for somebody to piggyback on my answer when I need another source. Um, I think that um, they allowed that navigation. So you talked about how it made it more efficient to go both directions. Um, and how um, I think Kim maybe mentioned that that gave more opportunities for um, in terms of more economic opportunities for people to make money off not only the things that they were, you know, selling, but also the things that they were transporting. Um, and so what you just mentioned, Eric, about like those, how they strap those barges together <laughs> and um, can travel, can transport so many goods. Um, and then also, I'm going to take it back to fashion and shopping and talk about those buttons and how um, having access to those buttons from France probably really um, pushed a little a little bit of a fashion forward theme. And it makes me think about maybe Kentucky has benefited from some of those fashion imports in the way that we see hats at the Derby now. Maybe they report <laughs> buttons from France um, in the 1800s. That's awesome, yeah. Does anybody want to add on to Maggie's share? I don't think you can add on to Maggie's. I think that was pretty much perfection. Oh, thank you, Kim. All right. Thank you, everyone.